welcome to the conference of the International Conference on Global Security, Nation States and Fragile Transnationalism. Well, this conference is a product and outcome of a cooperation. And I would like to thank all participants and partnered institutions, your excellencies, Mr. Ambassadors, professors, colleagues, and distinguished guests. Our specific agenda in today's conference is nation states and fragile transnationalism. We have selected this topic because we know that there's an emerging trend that transnationalism seals international environment. On the other hand, there's another fact, state is still in charge and conventionality of the Cold War era is back. In this sense, we, totally 10 institutions of which three of them are universities from seven different countries organized this event just to scrutinize this new environment. And I have to remind and also announce the partner organizations just to inform public because this conference is being broadcast right now to the public. Set a foundation that I'm a member of it, Center for Afghanistan, Middle East and Africa of Institute of Strategic Studies Islamabad from Pakistan, NIF Strategy Center from Bucharest, Deutsche Orient Institute of Germany, Institute of International Relations Athens, Georgia Strategic Analysis Center, Georgia, Center for Diplomacy of Andrasi University, Bucharest, Istanbul Sabahattin Zaim University, Hasan Kalyoncu University of Turkey, and Andras University of Hungary. I would like to also thank to the crew that organized this event, mainly Amina Han from Pakistan, Benedict from Germany, Russo from Georgia, Demostatis from Greece, Izel Selim <coughs> from Romania, and Professor Kraft from Hungary, Andras University. The concept of the conference is based on both state-centric interpretation of security and emerging trends or setbacks of modern age, which is based on transnationalism. Actually, why we have drafted this because of the new emerging soft concerns, which is integrated with the hard threats, like intertwined natural security with all the new traditions, natural disasters, climate change, societal mobility, pandemic, climate change, sorry, living standards, energy crisis, or digital currencies, or space mining, or others like cultural expansionism or cultural, cultural shrinkage. In this sense, we have identified four different panels. In the first panel, we will delve global patterns of international politics, mainly focusing on shadows over the multilateral system. In the second panel, we will discuss coexistent cooperation and co uh, competition, mainly on sustainable regionalism. And in the third panel, we will discuss challenges to security old and new in a post-pandemic world. And we will discuss actually state it's either providing or consuming security. In the fourth panel, we will discuss transnationalism itself with worrying perspectives and beyond. In this sense, I would like to first invite keynote speakers uh, to inaugurate this conference. And I would like to present you Professor Burhanettin Dran, General Coordinator of SETA Foundation, to deliver his speech. Sir, the grant is yours. Sir, we can't hear you. Your microphone is off. Do you hear me now? Yes, Murat? yes, sir. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Murat. Uh, dear participants, most esteemed guests, and all our viewers from around the world, I'm glad to be addressing this meaningful conference from SETA's office in Istanbul. 
Such forums that bring together valued experts, such as yourselves, are the engine behind research centers, academia, and this, I believe, that will make a significant contribution to our understanding of global security. And I'm glad to be with colleagues from Pakistan, Romania, Germany, Greece, Georgia, and Hungary in order to discuss security issues of, of our world. As we all know, global security has become a buzzword in the last two decades and has been the cause of for many debates. We have witnessed as citizens of the world how our societies and states have been securitized in the last two decades. Some of this securitization impacts our own lives. We see this time every we take an, an airplane or cross a border. Uh, since the pandemic, uh, this is very about this is very critical about our health but uh it it is it included many issues as security problems security related thinking has been dominating the international arena as well the end of the cold war unfortunately did not bring about desecurization rather exaggerated the situation even more Post-Cold War peace operations in the Balkans, the deterioration of security in the Middle East, 9-11 attacks, that some of, the, some of the examples that have characterized the first phase of securitization in our own region and the entire globe. In the more contemporary era, discussions on security have focused on the post-Arab Spring Middle East, hybrid warfare, proxy warfare, and the struggle against terrorism. And now, uh, the Russian-Ukrainian war and the, and the security problems facing Europe and beyond. Turkey sits at the nexus of such developments. Turkey's southern border continues to present one of the most complex security challenges in the region. The situation in Syria and Iraq has led to heightened security calculations on Turkey's part. In this sense, security does not simply refer to more stringent military activities or cross-border operations. Turkey, like many other countries, is facing multidimensional security challenges. Irregular migration, climate change, asymmetric adversaries, all, all of them are part of the list with new challenges presenting themselves. One of the greatest challenges to Euro-Atlantic security, of which Turkey is an indispensable part of, it, part of emanates from Russia as recent events have illustrated. Of course, I'm talking about the Russian invasion of Ukraine. This invasion has once again highlighted the difficult post-Cold War security environment for Europe and its immediate neighborhood. Conventional methods of thought predicted that power, security, and competition would balance out in the post-Cold War world. But on the contrary, we are witnessing the resurgence of revisionism, hard power politics, great power rivalry and heightened security calculations. The security challenges of today's world are not singular like before. Bipolarity and unipolarity have given way to a novel multipolarity. Today's security challenges are complex and multifaceted and asymmetrical. Of course, collective organizations are thinking, rethinking their uh, strategic uh, calculations and like NATO, uh, the, NATO recalibrating their security architecture with these conditions in mind. In the coming months, there will be a new uh, uh, NATO discussion on the future of uh, Atlantic security. The events in Ukraine have reminded the world that the notion of security remains an extremely fragile one. And unfortunately, today we are talking about uh, World War Three or tactical nuclear bombs and, and the threat that they may come to, to, to the world. And the people that are using these terms are not academics, they are the state officials. So today uh, we are so much uh, preoccupied with the global security issues than before. Our analytical lenses are more equipped than ever in contemplating such fragilities and producing responses in turn. And I believe that this discussion will make a great contribution to our understanding of the changing nature of global security. And I would once again like to welcome all of you to this conference and I'd like to wish for fruitful debates. Thank you, Murat.
Thank you, sir, for, for these remarks. And I would like to invite His Excellency Ambassador Dr. Andreas Reinecke, the director of Deutsches Orient Institute. The grant is yours, sir. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. I would also like to welcome you on behalf of the Deutsches Orient Institute, as, which, as you may know, is the oldest German institute dealing with the Middle East and North Africa. And uh, some of you may know that we issue the quarterly, the Orient, which is the only uh, journal in uh, Germany in English language uh, dealing with this area. Um, I'm particularly happy that we could join this event, which is an event, as Professor Duran had said, of seven international institutions uh, dealing with this topic of global security. From a German perspective, this is a particularly timely and I also dare to say a sad moment because today, the Deutsche Bundestag uh, will adopt a motion, um, a bipartisan motion, uh, which will support the increase of military financing by uh, 100 billion uh, euros over the next years. This is a change in politics in Germany, first time since 30 years. I say it is sad, although it is necessary, because we obviously would prefer to use this amount of money for other challenges. But therefore, uh, this conference shows how complex the situation will be. I would like also to remind all of us that global security is not limited to the hard security. Although I just mentioned this motion, which the Deutsche Bundestag will pass today. It is much more. And that's why I'm very happy that we have addressing other challenges. One of the panels is post pandemic and which will address the question, how does the pandemic will have changed or has changed security patterns, cooperational patterns. And we're not discussing this today, but I would like to remind all of us also of the climate change, which is not only a question of, uh, of the uh, climate affecting various areas, but which also may have security consequences. We're not addressing this right now, but I think if we're speaking of global security, these areas, these topics are also part of what we're doing. The topics and the questions which are in front of us are really very, very, very large. We have the question of hard security. Professor Turan has mentioned this for Europe, the question of Ukraine, war is new, the, the, uh, the, the security risks we are facing, we suddenly see that countries like Sweden and Finland are seriously considering, considering joining NATO, something which was unimaginable uh, a month ago, I would say. Um, but uh, we have also the question of how is the international system functioning? The former German Minister of Foreign Affairs had launched an initiative of multilateralism, increasing multilateralism. We see how difficult it is. We have seen the mission of UN Secretary General Guterres right now, uh, Turkey, Moscow, and now Kiev. We have seen 140 plus members of the United Nations condemning Russia for its aggression, uh, coming back to something which was unimaginable before. We have seen Russians' membership in the Human Rights Council suspended, also a complete new approach, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we need to rethink. We will not be able to give answers today because it is too complex, but I think we should be able today to frame some of these issues uh, in order to concentrate and focus the discussion which will come in the near future. And I'm particularly happy that this discussion will take place in a multinational, multilateral context, no, multinational context. We have um, colleagues uh, from Pakistan, from Georgia, uh, from Turkey, from Greece, from Hungary, from Romania, from Germany. I would say a rather unusual 
but very necessary mix. And that's why I would thank Seda uh, to have organized this. And I wish all of us very interesting discussions and a fruitful day. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I hope we will promote this visual thinking. And I would like to invite uh, His Excellency Ambassador Aizaz Ahmed Chowdhury, the Director of Institute of Strategic Studies, Islamabad, to deliver his keynote speech. Sir, the ground is yours. Sir, we can't hear you. Your microphone is off. Yeah, we tend to <laughs> forget this basic SOP. Well, I thank you, uh, Dr. Slan and CETA Foundation for inviting me to this conference and share my thoughts on this very important subject of global security. I've heard two very good speeches. Let me share with you how I look at the world uh, uh, and the order that had defined our world since Second World War, war um, change with profound impact on global security. Uh, I see a new multipolar world is emerging. I see unilateralism by some powers is increasing. Reliance on multilateralism uh, to resolve conflicts is on the decline. The UN Charter principles of respect for each other's sovereignty and territorial integrity are being disregarded or even violated. Hatred for outsiders, uh, also called xenophobia, and hatred for Islam, also called Islamophobia, remain at dangerously high levels. So consequently, the world politics is becoming deeply polarized. Now, amidst this growing global disorder, a complication of far-reaching consequences is also emerging. The United States is now firmly locked in a major power competition strategic competition with China and Russia. Now, this competition is now intensifying. There are concerns about the world getting divided into different camps. Smaller and middle-sized middle countries are struggling to find the right balance in maintaining their relations with opposing major powers. Another challenge to today's geopolitics is the emergence of non-traditional security threats, as was just mentioned, such as climate change, food insecurity, water scarcity, energy crunches, migration issues, cyber issues, and so on. Now, the world economy has also come under severe pressure because of COVID-19 pandemic, and now more recently because of the war in Ukraine. Now, after sketching this overall picture, let me focus a little on the Ukraine war because this has now emerged as the most serious threat to global security at the moment. The Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine has complicated the geopolitics of today. The end to war is not in sight. A stalemate is prevailing. The NATO countries seem determined to provide a high level of military assistance for Ukraine. However, the NATO has refrained from direct involvement in the conflict. This will likely prevent the war in Ukraine from spreading to other parts of the world. But meanwhile, the civilian casualties are mounting. Ukrainians are fleeing to neighboring countries. The United States, European Union, and members of NATO are likely to scale up their sanctions against Russia. Since many of the European nations are dependent on Russian oil and gas, the European Union would probably need to find urgent ways to diversify their sources of energy away from Russia and into LNG and wind and solar and so on. The West also seems to be somewhat divided uh, over implementing blanket sanctions against Russia. Uh, but let's see. When I look at China, uh, it is extending rhetorical support or principled support to Russia. And, and many Chinese companies are maintaining their operations in Russia. While many Western companies are exiting Russia because of sanctions, the Chinese companies 
could fill the gap uh, without violating, of course, the sanctions. A few words about the COVID impact. The COVID cases are certainly coming down in most countries. This has enabled recovery in services sectors and resumption of supply chains. China is still dealing with localized outbreaks. And since China is following a zero COVID policy, it may expedite steps to relocate some of the manufacturing to other countries. But this uh, threat has not really, uh, a threat of COVID-19 has not really fully gone away. When I look at your beautiful country, Turkey, with which I have very close association, I have visited it many times, I believe that Turkey uh, is also witnessing the impact uh, of uh, uh, the war in Ukraine and uh, consequent uh, high inflation. Turkish economy, for example, is suffering from high inflation, a weakening lira, and now global economic interruptions being caused by the Russian-Ukraine war. Uh, on the Ukraine war, Turkey, like many other countries, are, is in a very tight spot. On the one hand, it needs to maintain neutrality in the Russian-Ukraine war, as it is worried about Russian energy and food exports to Turkey. But on the other, Turkish neutrality is not appreciated that well by fellow NATO countries. So in these circumstances, I think Turkey might find it useful to improve relations with regional countries to get increased investment and trade. In fact, only this morning when I was browsing the news, I saw President Erdogan uh, and uh, King Salman of Saudi Arabia reaching out to, to each other. Coming to the Gulf countries, I see that Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates could leverage their positions as major oil producers uh, uh, to stabilize the energy prices, but they could also get use this to get diplomatic concessions and military assistance from the United States. Still staying on the region, Iran, I see that US and Iran are endeavoring to reach an agreement to resume the 2015 JCPOA agreement on Iran nuclear deal, but there are still some roadblocks. Meanwhile, regional tensions are persisting, particularly between Iran and Israel, and also between Iran and the Gulf Arab countries. On the positive side, side if this agreement is reached, this could reduce pressures on global oil market. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, from the perspective of global security, if any escalation of conflict takes place involving Iran, that could be highly destabilizing uh, for the entire uh, Middle East. So there are huge stakes in these negotiations on Iran. When I look at Central Asia, I see that Russia's economy uh, uh, is uh, severely uh, contracted by Western sanctions. And the economies of Central Asian states, which are highly interdependent upon Russia, are also facing an economic downturn, especially those countries uh, which depend on Russian remittances. Now, if, if I come to South Asia, I, I see India uh, has also adopted neutrality on the Ukraine war, uh, mainly because of its interdependent relationship with Russia. Uh, this has caused some anxiety in the US, but US no, has not reacted sharply because it still considers India as an important ally in its counter China policy. On the economic side, India is facing what the rest of the world is facing, energy and food prices are going up. Uh, and uh, in case of India, even Russian fertilizer on which India depends. So the priority for Indian government at this stage seems to be to manage the economy so that there is no social unrest. Pakistan likewise uh, is pursuing a policy of balanced relations with all major powers, including China, the US and Russia. So its main preoccupation in the security realm is to deal with terrorism threats, which are still there by Tariqe Taliban Pakistan and Balochistan Liberation Army. Pakistan is also concerned about the situation in Afghanistan. If peace does not come there, it would affect Pakistan. In fact, it would affect the whole region. Within the country, the political uncertainty in Pakistan has brought our economy under stress. High level oil and commodity prices are also forcing the government to give additional subsidies. Uh, and all this is uh, uh, creating high fiscal deficits and uh, difficulties for the economy. 
when I look at Afghanistan, unfortunately, it is suffering from a, a, hum, a worsening economic situation and a humanitarian disaster. The Taliban government has not yet rec been recognized formally by the international community. Some terrorist groups are resurfacing. All this is a recipe for continuing instability in Afghanistan. The world expects the Taliban to meet the expectations on inclusive government, women's rights, and counterterrorism measures. The ineffective governance and instability in Afghanistan should be a concern for the whole world because if the terrorists come back to Afghanistan, the region and the world will suffer. So abandoning Afghanistan will be a huge mistake. Let me, after this scan of uh, our region, let me make four conclusions uh, and identify four issues that have an Im immediate impact on global security and security of nearly every country. First, the war in Ukraine has complicated global security. The West sanctions against Russia are also a factor of instability because while sanctions may achieve part of the objectives, they create considerable negative side effects. It is not clear when and how the war would end. However, what is clear is that even if the Russia-Ukraine talks succeed and a ceasefire is achieved, uh, the West sanctions against Russia are likely to continue. The Western countries might be reluctant to purchase Russian crude oil and natural gas, and therefore food and energy prices would thus remain high. <laughs> Second, high inflation has gripped major parts of the world. Food, fertilizer, energy prices have shot up. This is undermining economic recovery of most countries. The poor countries have been hit the hardest. Apart from the energy crunch and price hikes, supply chain bottlenecks are also disrupting the economic recovery of most countries. Third, social unrest in the developing country and even in the emerging economies is a, real, is a possibility because the high energy prices have slowed down economic growth and, are, and is now affecting household cost of living and operational cost of doing business. So food and energy shortages will be a huge challenge for most of the emerging and developing economies because the governments have less fiscal space to find the right balance between fighting inflation and encouraging growth. Fourth, the threat of COVID-19 pandemic may have receded in some parts of the world, but it is continuing, but its continuing presence in, Afghan, in China indicates that the world must now must not lower its guard. Learn to live with it and find the balance between economic growth on the one hand and social distancing practices or measures on the other. There is also the threat of new and contagious variants of the virus. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, what I have stated above is, is certainly not a rosy picture, but yes, we have sir. to accept the situation as it is and not as we want it to be. This conference is a reminder that global security is a collective responsibility. We are all secure if each one of us is secure. Conversely, we are all insecure if some of us are insecure. A return to UN charter principles of interstate conduct has never been felt more compelling than it is today. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I would like to pass the floor, Professor Ahmed Cevad Ajar, Rector of Istanbul Sabahattin Zayn University, of which I'm a member of it, proudly. Sir, the grant is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Murat Aslan. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Dear colleagues, distinguished guests, you are welcome to this conference. Uh, on behalf of Istanbul Sabahattin Zaim University, I would like to express my gratitude and thanks to those who facilitated the conference. In this sense, I will come future cooperation with uh, the partner institutes and universities. I believe that this event will contribute to our knowledge after listening different perspectives of scholars and experts from the nine countries and 10 organizations. The theme of this year's conference is global security in this regard to nation states and transnationalism. Although the conference was planned long before the Russia and Ukraine war, 
mainly focusing on the context of security concerns. The conflict of the last two months reminded us that of the mutual interaction of states and transnational patterns. The post-Cold War era was coined with ambiguity and ethnic and religious conflicts. Although terrorism wasn't a new phenomenon, but new millennium pointed out that outcomes of the September elements. But the color revelations and Arab Springs or winter raised societal concerns. Due to the Iraq and Afghan interventions, security uh, literature, literature continued its expansion of inventing new terms and concepts like proxies, hybrid, and cyber wars and threats. Meanwhile, soft cities pushed to the cities to act. In this context, humanitarian catastrophes, societal turmoil, climate change, cultural protectionism, epidemic and pandemics, and many emerging concerns forced cities to mobilize themselves, themselves accordingly. Furthermore, societies demand prosperity, a more suitable environment for progress and honored life. Once it has been ignored by the state, societal pressure has become a factor to set our reward. <clears throat> Today, Sir, your microphone is muted. Sorry. Today, we face an old paradigm, war. Russia has started a military campaign with self-style arguments. Hence, humans and humanity at all are experiencing the original settings of conventional warfare. But emerging soft threats that make states vulnerable are still there. It is most likely the immigration and wildfire of the last year will continue to occupy the, our agenda. The pandemic will end, but its economic impact will change the regime security in many countries. We may face new soft threats that we could not even imagine now. What will do we, uh, the epistemic community do? First, we must continue to search and explore the contribute to the progress in achieving security. Then we must share what we have concluded. It is a fact that neither of cities, communities, individuals, or humanity does have a privilege to have an exception and exemption from the outcomes of the current insecurity. I see this conference as an opportunity to discuss all these issues and challenges to global security. The conference is being broadcasted to nine countries. I hope it will be develop our awareness of the peoples in these countries and colleagues. I wish for a fruitful exchange of perspectives and ideas. I thank all of you, especially the, the organizing committee, since they have willed this opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I would like to pass floor to Professor Heinrich Kraft from Center for Diplomacy, Budapest Andresi University. Sir, the ground is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Aslan. Uh, good morning to everybody. Many, many important things have already been said, so I, I will add only a few remarks on, uh, on Europe as I'm sitting in Budapest uh, in uh, Eastern and Central Europe. Well, Europe is in danger. This infamous and often quoted statement 
of the High Representative of the European Union of Affairs, of Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, Joseph Borrell, may have sounded exaggerated last year, or even in the first two months of this year. This has dramatically changed. The recent major Russian offensive against uh, Ukraine after seven years, we should not forget that, seven years of a frozen conflict has triggered extraordinary international reactions uh, that are likely to completely change the geopolitical reality, at least in Europe, and I think also beyond. This change must have come as a shock, as a shock to many, including decision makers in Russia. Germany, it was already mentioned by Ambassador Ranike, announced an extreme reshaping of its foreign and security policy, sending lethal weapons to Ukraine and announcing a drastic, a drastic increase in its defense budget. The EU is still a military dwarf, no doubt about that. But the organization's decision to support one of the fighting parties with lethal military aid could spark a debate of the supranationalization of the CFSP, the common foreign and security policy. Current events have reinvigorated domestic debates, for example, already mentioned uh, in Finland and Sweden about a possible NATO accession. Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, have officially asked for EU membership. The escalation has also demonstrated the indispensability of the United States as NATO's anchor country and Europe's protecting power. The only thing, the only thing that is certain today is that Europe's future security architecture will look very different from what it did before February 24th. With a major war in Europe, at the gates of the European Union, we face an uncertain geopolitical future. Also, with a view to China and the global balance of power, a lot has been said by others on this. The liberal world order is under fire from various sides. I will be speaking on one of, on, 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 on the first panel on this issue. Therefore, Dr. Aslan, this conference is very timely. My university is based in Hungary. Hungary has a border with Ukraine and was flooded with refugees like Poland, Slovakia, Romania, and Moldova. So I congratulate you for this initiative and I'm very much looking forward to listening to all your contributions. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. You're welcome, thank you. And now I will pass the word to Mr. Nodar Harshiladze, the founder of Georgian Strategic Analysis Center and former Deputy Minister of Internal Affairs of Georgia. Your Excellency, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. And I would like to use this opportunity to thank uh, SETA and uh, its organizers for this wonderful opportunity. I would like to personally thank Mr. Murat Taslan for organizing such an important event. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, now I have one organizational question before I proceed. Are we unifying opening remarks with a speech or we are just proceeding with short opening remarks? No, no, this is the keynote speech. That means opening remarks and you will have another space in your panel. Yes, I got it. Okay. Perfect. So, yes, I, I think that uh, my colleagues uh, already mentioned uh, a number of the challenges we're facing. And uh, of course, elephant in the room, as my Hungarian colleague already mentioned, is the war in Europe, of course. Nobody has foreseen it. I mean... We had a number of conflicts in different parts of the world, but they were mostly on at, at, at least at, at some limited um, power use or some anti-terrorist operations. It, it, it was some kind of the civil wars, but uh, never, I think, since the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, we have seen such a invasion of the Ukraine, which is happening now. Uh, absolutely unprecedented. Of course, it will change in many things. I mean, the, we've seen the change in German position. We've seen change in many other countries. I mean, we we openly, our Pakistani colleague very well spoke about China's new opportunities now in the region who will uh, certainly occupy this um, uh, emptiness in Russian market, which, which will um, further benefit increase of the China, which is 
it's debatable is it a good thing or not and of course our region becomes even more important because uh, if we are talking about energy security which now after yesterday's russian statements become even more important russia will start cutting energy to european union countries who refuse to play by their rules uh, the corridor from caspian sea which goes through georgia and goes to turkey and then it supplies energy to europe becomes even more important so those alternatives which were shelved after the um, 2000s, which were the number of the multinational projects will become important again. And I think such an event gives us, um, they give us opportunity to discuss what we can do, how we can benefit being in think tanks, in uh, analytical organizations to provide decision makers and politicians with ideas, how to solve this crisis, because there is no one solution. We have seen it. There are many of those solutions and resources are more than limited and even more time is limited. I mean, time is of the essence and uh, we have seen that with this um, information exchange accelerated, things are changing faster than we, we could sometimes analyze it. So uh, let's use this opportunity to come together once more and, you know, and uh, come up with some interesting idea, which I already heard some of it. And once more, thank you very much for this opportunity, Mr. Aslan, and I'm sure we'll have a very interesting conference. So thank you. So that concludes the keynote speeches uh, to start the conference. And now we have the first panel, Global Patterns of International Politics and Shadows over Multilateral System. Professor Murat Yeshiltaş, Director of Set foreign policy department and faculty member of Ankara Social Sciences University will moderate this panel. Uh, actually, his main interest is geopolitics, military civilian relations and security studies. So I would like to pass the floor to Professor Yeshiltaş to start the first panel. Sir, the grant is yours. Thank you, uh, Dr. Murat, and thank you uh, for uh, accepting our invitation uh, and uh, being with us today. And, and thank you also for the uh, participants in other institutions, which uh, gave a very strong support to organize this timely and important meeting. And uh, in this uh, panel, we have uh, three distinguished speaker, actually, we have uh, four distinguished speakers, but Dr. Talha uh, will try to join us if uh, he can be available uh, to speak. Uh, he is on the way to uh, Brussels, so therefore he may not have, uh, you know, opportunity to join us. Uh, uh, we have uh, distinguished speakers from different institutions in the first panel. The the. The title of the first panel is The Global Patterns of International Politics. Uh, the subtitle is The Shadows Over Multilateral System, in which uh, previous uh, keynote speakers uh, rightly mentioned different aspects of these challenges uh, against the uh, very nature of the uh, uh, multilateral system. And, and I think it became uh, important after the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. So we need to talk about more about the uh, challenges uh, against multilateral or the possibility of multilateral international system. So therefore, in this panel, we are trying to find a, a comprehensive answer to the questions about the global patterns of international politics. Important. So the uh, we have Hendrik, Professor Henrik Kraft. Uh, he is the member of uh, the board of the trustees of the German Orient Foundation and uh, Center for Diplomacy. And we have also Ambassador Theodor Molenschu, member of the Scientific Council of Neve Strategic Center. He is also former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Romania. We have uh, Mr. Noder. Karsiladze, uh, he is the founder of uh, GCAC, former, he is also former Deputy Minister of International Affairs. So I would like to firstly give the floor to Professor Henrik Krebs uh, to give his uh, speech. We have uh, 10 minutes for each speaker and we are trying to uh, understand the uh, global patterns of international politics in this panel. Uh, Professor Kraft, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much, uh, Professor Yesitash. Um, as I already mentioned in my, my keynote, I will be talking about uh, the liberal global order. After, after World War II, under American leadership, a rules-based international order emerged that overcame the chaos of the interwar period. It made a long period of prosperity and peace possible in the Euro Atlantic regions, but also in some places in Asia and in East Asia and other parts of the world. And in the last instance, it also helped to reduce the antagonism between the East and the West. This order was decisively deepened after the end of the Cold War. And from that on, it can be really called a liberal international order. Such a liberal world order continues incentives for the democratization of the participating states. It builds on international institutions to deal with interdependence problems. It secures reasonably open borders and aims at the recognition of individual rights. This liberal order and the global governance associated with it came under double fire in recent years. For example, shortly after after the, 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 um, the victory, the inauguration of uh, Donald Trump, a well-known American analyst, uh, Bob Kagan, wrote a um, citation, the collapse of the world order with all that entails may not be so far off. And later he added in even clearer terms, citation, the democratic alliance that formed the foundation of the liberal world order under US leadership is unraveling. At least in Eastern Europe, the peace that ha that that alliance and that order underpinned has collapsed on February 24th. Trump, however, was not the cause, but the expression of a deeper crisis, a deeper crisis of the liberal order. For years, we have seen in, in the US and in other countries a growing skepticism, a growing skepticism of multilateral organizations and also of free trade. Worldwide, we have seen growing illiberal nationalist critique of the existing order. To be sure, what is often described by the, the catchphrase liberal world order is a complex web of norms and institutions that was neither clearly laid down in one document nor was it ever free of contradictions. But if one looks at its normative core, three basic principles can be identified, which are also referred to in political science as the triangle of peace because of their peace promoting effect. Liberal democracy as the guiding political model, economic cooperation within the framework of open economies, and institutionalized multilateralism within the framework of a rules-based order. The institutions founded in the middle of the 20th century, such as the United Nations, in the economic sphere, the institutions created by the Bretton Woods Agreement, and in the security sphere, at least in the uh, transatlantic realm, NATO, but also the network of bilateral security guarantees of the United States still form the backbone of this order until today. This order was still essentially limited to the Western world during the period of the East-West conflict, but it became globalized to a certain extent at least after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the disintegration of the Soviet Union. Never before had liberal ideas determined world politics in such a profound way. In almost every part of the world, regional organizations adopted treaties to protect democracy. UN peacekeeping missions followed a liberal script and served as transmission belts for liberal regulatory policies. Non-Western great powers such as China and Russia were increasingly integrated into the liberal order, linked to the hope that they would become responsible stakeholders in that that order to um, uh, to use this uh, this uh, this 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 time uh, this time which was uh, 
coined by um, uh, by a former uh, World Bank uh, boss and uh, U.S. secretary. Further three free trade rounds accelerated the exchange of goods, capital, and services. At the same time, the network of international organizations grew even tighter and their powers increased. The European integration process took on new momentum in the 1990s, leading to both an enlargement and a deepening of the European Union. And while the latter remained by far the, the most far-reaching experiment in supranational cooperation, many regional organizations followed the European model of regional integration. International jurisdiction was also further developed with the establishment of the International Criminal Court as the provisional culmination, I would, I would call it. The global responsibility to protect was proclaimed and a wide variety of measures were linked to respect of human rights. State sovereignty was defined more and more restrictively. The world order became increasingly liberal. This process has been reversed. It has been reversed for some time already. The current phase can rather be described as the illiberal moment a phase in which these basic liberal principles are being called into question. They are called into question from the outside by the rise of authoritarian great powers that pursue divergent ideas of order and have just not integrated into liberal order as smoothly as we, or at least as many have hoped. And they are called into question from the inside. From the inside, by the emergence of illiberal political forces in almost all countries of the West. The conviction that liberal democracy is the only legitimate model of political order is being challenged by various actors around the globe. On the one hand, an alternative illiberal model or order has emerged, autocratic state capitalism, which at least because of its economic success, success has found supporters around the globe. It is being presented by its representatives ever more aggressively and confidently as an alternative, as an alternative to the combination of liberal democracy and, and a market economy. This is of course particularly done by the China, the China of President uh, Xi Jinping. I will stop here in order to give uh, plenty, uh, plenty time for, for discussion uh, uh, with, with the audience. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you. Thank you. Th thank you, Professor Kraft. Uh, so uh, without taking your time, uh, I would like to give the floor to Ambassador Theodor Melaschuk is the member of Scientific Council of MIV Strategic Center. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much. May I first of all uh, thank uh, the initiative of uh, Mr. Aslan and, and I hope that this was a, a, a fantastic uh, possibility to discuss about these uh, issues. Practically, we are discussing about the need of uh, readjustment of international uh, society in competition, unfortunately. Multilater multilateralism is one of the, of, the, of the tools. And I think we should start it uh, with the Cold War, with your permission, about the evolution of these issues. For the European countries, maybe one of the pillars was the in August 1975, when a major uh, diplomatic agreement was signed in Helsinki at the conclusion of the first conference on security and cooperation in Europe. This uh, Helsinki agreement accords were the first effort to reduce tension between the Soviet and the Western uh, blocs by securing uh, their, let's say, common acceptance of the post-World War II as a status quo in Europe. 
the accords were assigned and a lot of countries uh, joined the DC. There are also an, an, a very important uh, effort on behalf of different other countries, the end of the communist uh, regimes, and also the efforts to try to find some solutions for, uh, for security in, uh, in Europe. In 1990, the foreign minister of Germany, um, uh, Germany, Hans-Dietrich Genscher, promoted the idea of the Council of European Security. Uh, minister, Prime Minister of Poland, Tadeusz uh, Mazowiecki, proposed the creation of a permanent Council of um, European Cooperation. And in 1990, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev proposed a vision of a Europe transcending the military alliances based on pan-European institutions. Václav Havel and others, including President Mitterrand, were uh, trying to create an European confederation combining with the states from Western and Eastern uh, 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 Europe. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, unfortunately, things uh, have changed and the top uh, preoccupation is represented by the extension of NATO and the European Union. And of course, the Russian Federation is one of these uh, players. Uh, USA and China is preoccupied by their security. The approach of Russia is to build a bumper between NATO and European Union to ensure their security. It is obvious that the reset of the international society is needed. The main country like United States in economy and, uh, and uh, military, Russia is an important military force, and China is competition in economic and the military. None of them cannot make loans. The rules taking into account that all are needed to, for regional organization support as the European Union, Africa, Latin America, Arab countries and others. There is a need to put more power for the regional organizations. The only system which exists in, is in the United Nations. Together with the regional organizations, we should support the UN mechanisms based on international law and mutual respect. There is an issue, which is the nuclear armament. Nuclear armaments of nuclear states, recognized by the Non-Proliferation Treaty, decided not to use uh, nuclear weapons. The examples of uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki are very bad examples. There are no provisions of rules or international treaties or conventions, but they understand, I hope, that uh, do not desire for a total destruction of Earth. The use of nuclear weapons imply costs, much money, and few benefits. Few countries can afford to develop nuclear weapons for destroying themselves. The military conflict in, in Ukraine is uh, demonstrating that negotiations cannot arrive to a solution without difficulties. That's why my main idea is to underline the importance of multilateral structures and their relationship with the bilateral diplomacy. One of the top issues uh, to use is the role of mediators uh, when we speak about uh, Ukraine and Russia in the times of confrontation between states which have difficulties in a dialogue. They should putting down the instruments of fake news and looking for a dialogue using the mediators uh, especially. A mediator could invite the parties on a neutral place with cold, open, uh, real negotiate, negotiations. As I said, it is clear that uh, we should make use of all instruments, public international law, activity of international and regional organizations. And I believe that this will solve 
a lot of confrontations and proposals which contribute to final agreement. When we speak about the future of, uh, of the security in our region, Romania is it's a country in a very interesting place. We are representing the eastern border of NATO and the European Union. And at the same time, they are practically a country in the, in the Black Sea and in the extended region of, uh, of the Black Sea. That's why we have to understand that we cannot go alone in a period of big difficulties. There are issues which cannot be solved by countries, but also they should have also find the possibilities for uh, ideas like, uh, I don't know, pandemics, uh, uh, energy problems, uh, a lot of issues which are practically putting a lot of pressure for, for all these countries. There are, we have to, to, to take into account the fact that the three important uh, pillars of the uh, international uh, uh, diplomacy is, of course, the United States, uh, Russia, and China. But at the same time, we have to take into account that countries like uh, Turkey, India, Pakistan, uh, Arab countries, and others, they are real players in, uh, in this uh, international activity. That's why I think one of our top priorities is to try to find solutions in order to support the United Nations, but at the same time using, as I said, the activity of the uh, regional organizations. All these issues can be solved provided we are being able in the future to have a better dialogue and using also the possibilities of all countries to prevail about the issues uh, which are practically bringing to the uh, conflicts in a way or, or another. That's why I am thanking you very much for uh, your presentation and at the same time at your disposal to answer of, on issues if it is needed and if we have the, the necessary time for this. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, uh, Ambassador Molenshu. Uh, our final speaker is Mr. Noder Karsiladze. Uh, he is the founder of GCAC. Uh, he's also former Deputy Minister of International Affairs of Georgia. Uh, Mr. Noder, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mr. Yashiltash. It's always a challenge to be a final speaker, of course, in any panel. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, we have a very interesting topic. It's a shadow of a multilateral system, if I'm not mistaken. No one might even question, does the system exist anymore? I mean, because the things are developing kind of in opposite direction, as my Hungarian colleague mentioned. And while I think that... Uh, our distinction, distinguished Romanian colleague gave more optimistic view of the future. Uh, I think we need to work very hard to arrive there because definitely time of uh, romantism in international relations, which was part of the nineties is over. I mean, nor China, neither Russia will be the responsible players of international system. That's the fact. Uh, there will be players, of course, but they will have their own agenda, which might coincide or might not coincide with the Western agenda. And world is no more Western oriented. That's what we should have to understand. That's not necessarily a bad thing, by the way, because uh, Cold War used to make it all the focus on the West. And now we see the more and more players emerging in the other parts of the world. However, one thing we should admit that things are changing rapidly, sometimes more rapidly than we can comprehend. And our systems are not necessarily designed uh, to comprehend such a change because we are now in one of the unique stages of the uh, history where we have a double change, double challenge. What the double challenge means that on the one hand, we still have all the changes of the Cold War era. And if we don't believe in it, please let's look at the, what happening in Ukraine, very classical military invasion, which is an older type of change. And on the same time, the technology exchange of information, uh, evolution of the methods 
how information is exchanged, internet, social media, this new generation, emerging new trends, multilateral cooperation, you name it, number of the things. They, of course, brought a new, new threats, new challenges. I mean, this international terrorism and the international criminal organizations, which are becoming more and more powerful and playing more and more increasingly, of course, uh, negative, but role in the international system. I, we have seen entire coalition of the countries uh, tried and failed to tackle such a threat. I mean, without naming any countries, we know that in the neighboring regions, there were two operations uh, which were not successful, to put it mildly. So this is the double challenge. challenge. On the one hand, all challenges, and on the other hand, the new challenges. Is system geared up with the, to, to handle those challenges? Hardly. Because on the one hand, uh, I don't want to state obvious, but on the one hand, you have a United Nation, which has to be uh, dealing with that, but it's uh, an utterly outdated structure, which hardly reflects even the realities of the 90s. I mean, with the, with the with Security Council, with the, the, the extended Security Council, with non-permanent members, huge bureaucracies. We have European Union, of course, which tries to play its role. And now, to my positive surprise, I have to say that it, it turns out to be much more unified when the crisis came than we all suspected. And that's a positive thing, of course. We have a NATO, of course, which uh, continues to be the most successful military alliance in the history of the humankind because it's it's it survived its initial purpose. But again, these are very much geared up to deal with the Cold War threats and Cold War era challenges. And things has evolved very, very rapidly. Plus, um, of course, let's not forget the elephant in the room of, in multilateral system. It's the United States of America. You see, I, I think they are in the most challenging situation now because Mr. Obama has announced the shift towards Asia, okay? Pacific shift was announced and it was very, uh, um, let's say categorical. So the number of times that Europe needs to take care of itself now, they are rich enough, they're powerful enough. Some of the European countries, of course, uh, thought it as an opportunity. Some of the European countries were very unhappy with the US withdrawal from the Europe. However, the fact was happening that the shift toward the Pacific was underway. And now suddenly uh, Russia just reminded everybody that's not so fast. Now, US still needs to deal with these challenges, which is it outlined for itself in the Pacific what kind of the issues should be solved. And we see there are some movements that now Japan was invited in this uh, uh, trilateral alliance. But at the same time, US need now full focus back to European continent again. Uh, does it have sufficient resources or does it even have sufficient political will to maintain such a double focus? Because now Ukrainian conflict is afresh it's, uh, we all see the atrocities, we all see this um, death of civilians and that will fuel public opinion for some time, of course. But I mean, by our modest analysis, this conflict will not end soon. I mean, there are very realistic scenarios how it will, might last several months more, especially in the summer, which Russia will use this uh, Ukraine geography and the weather to launch a new, new offensive. So, Will Europe and United States be able to maintain this kind of unity as time will put more and more pressure and test on it? That's also part of the test of the multi multilateral system. Uh, one thing which is obvious as well, that uh, Turkey's role is increasing significantly. I mean, it's always been a bridge between West and East, geographical at least, culture as well. And today this is, becomes as a literal bridge. You see that? Turkey is a very interesting position. I mean, I have to congratulate Turkish diplomacy and following Turkish uh, politics, trying to follow quite uh, um, closely. And uh, uh, Turkey is a, one of the exceptional countries which gets gratitude from both Russia and Ukraine. And this is the important that you continue to do so because we need somebody who can, of course, mediate, who can provide the um, uh, calmer and more let's say, neutral position to, to, to many issues. And I think that your position today is more than welcome because, uh, I mean, Hungary is uh, at least a bit shielded geographically from, from Russia. But uh, I mean, uh, starting from my country, going up to even Romania, we have, uh, who is the next question is arriving. 
And yes, they are protected by NATO, but are they protected by NATO? That's also the question. So we are arriving in a new point where this challenge will now remind us Cold War times. However, next uh, challenge can be a very new type of the challenge related with international terrorism. And of course, let's not forget about the icing of the cake, which is the COVID-19. We don't know what's going to happen with that. Now we are all kind of relaxed and uh, more like looking forward to optimistically, but we don't know how it will turn out. And the challenges it posed on international system was significant. Of course, a refugee crisis is awaiting Europe now. I mean, maybe even the similar size refugee crisis it was uh, for after the Syria, Syrian conflict, because we already have several million of the people uh, going to European Union, and the number will only increase. And let's see if the the the, the you will be ready to to tackle and handle such thing. And of course, we don't know how different players, especially players who are not inter, especially happy with status quo, such as the China, for example, will try to use prolonged states of this conflict. Uh, we don't know that because it's hard to guess how China will handle its relationship with Russia. Uh, and all of that, of course, comes back to us. Us meaning the countries which are in this region. For us, this is not distant geography. This is a very close proximity. And whatever happens there, it's immediately a cost on us, uh, on our economical, political security situation. I think that uh, we should explore and try to find some common formats because most of our, all of our countries are looking forward for sustainable peace, which is hard to find now. It's hard to come. It's a very nice phrase from 90s, and it was a reality back then. But today it's no more reality. So I think that uh, we would welcome, of course, um, more multinational formats, regional formats, of course, because uh, global format is only one and it's not seem to be working well, well. We would all like to see it more functional, but it is not. And that's the fact, let's not avoid it. More regional formats. I think that again, I will um, continue to, to stress, on, stress on it. We would like to see more active Turkey here because you guys have now a very unique position and lots of opportunities how to contribute to international peace and on the uh, Turkey number of times expressed this thing. Maybe there is not enough resources to handle the, all the issues, but I think regionally we can see lots of positive points from there. And of course, let's see how you're gonna handle the things because now Germany is increasing its military budget. While 100 million sounds uh, like uh, impressive, it's not that big increase to be honest. Uh, in number of the because it will be divided in a number of the years, and uh, uh, German military based on German own assessment uh, could use some upgrade really. Uh, and uh, then of course we have a France with its unique position trying to also solve the problems with Russia, but it's not working so far. So. Things are moving fast. Uh, I would um, suggest that um, we would come up uh, with, um, with new ideas how to handle this crisis because it's not only Ukraine. Let's not, uh, let's not forget that other things still exist, that there is a still crisis in Afghanistan. There is a still crisis in Africa. There, is a, there are the crises in different regions. So those things will continue to escalate because major players now focused on this. And while resources are drawn to this point, those points will start to be more and more complicated. So I think that uh, we will have a very interesting ideas. And I hope, again, I see lots of my Turkish colleagues, and I have a very special feeling. So Turkey, I spent part of my life there. So we are looking with the hope with you. And it's very timely that you organize this conference. I know it's coincided. It was planned before. And I hope that we will drive to some solutions to see how we can all together increase regional security. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Noder. So uh, thank you for all the participants. Now uh, I would like to give the floor to audience, but before I give the floor to the audience to receive their questions, I have three questions actually for the uh, distinguished panelists. The first one uh, is uh, for Professor Kreft. Um, professor, you, uh, you basically mentioned about the challenges against the liberal international order and uh, strongly highlighted that this is not a liberal international order anymore and we can define as illiberal international order which has 
great challenges. What do you think about the internal challenges in the creating of this illiberal order? I mean, especially the challenges which are coming from the internal dynamics of liberal international order. So this is the first question. And the second question uh, for uh, Mr. Ambassador and, and uh, former uh, foreign minister. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, you have a great experience in foreign policy, right? You became a, a minister of uh, foreign policy of Romania three times, as, as far as I know, if I'm not wrong. And based on your experience, this great experience, what's your expectation about the impact of a Ukraine invasion or the attempt to invade uh, Ukraine uh, on the uh, European security architecture? in which you, Romania is also an integral part of this security architecture. And the final question for uh, Mr. Noda. Uh, I'm just wondering about uh, the lessons learned for Georgia uh, uh, concerning the uh, Russian you know, uh, invasion of Ukraine, because you had also bad experience about Russian military uh, expansionism in your country. So what are the lessons learned for, for Georgia about this military interventionism? So I, will, I would like to uh, thank again, and you have two minutes uh, to answer your questions. So Professor Kreft, please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Um internal challenges to the uh, liberal order. Yes, um, nearly everywhere. And uh, the most prominent one uh, we have all uh, followed on, on TV on the 6th of January uh, last year, when, uh, when mm -hmm. the US Congress was, uh, was stormed by, uh, by, by a mob of people who, uh, who didn't accept the outcome of, of, of an election. And, and this in the very heart of uh, of of the, uh, the the principal country of uh, of this liberal world order, and uh, and it's not the uh, the U.S. alone. If you look, for example, at uh, at the uh, the different um, um, indexes, uh, for example, of uh, of uh, Freedom House uh, um, and others, in uh, 2020 uh, we had the 15th consecutive year in which there were more countries in the world that saw declines rather than improvements in political rights and civil liberties. And mm -hmm. uh, this is, you find them all around the world, um, particularly um, in, in Europe, in the European Union, many people um, uh, watched uh, uh, the French elections last Sunday and uh, the, um, the right-wing right, right -wing populist uh, Marine Le Pen, uh, well, she got close to, um, to, um, to, to govern a major country uh, of, uh, of Europe. And uh, you can imagine if uh, she, um, she is very anti-German and uh, well, at least those who agree that, uh, that German-French relations are crucial for, for the European Union, uh, then of course, uh, um, um, uh, it is clear that, uh, that uh, uh, Marine Le Pen winning these elections uh, would have changed fundamentally uh, mm -hmm. the European Union. And well, some would say it, 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 would, it would collapse uh, because, uh, because the, the driving forces uh, uh, of the European Union um, uh, would, uh, would be uh, neutralized. And um, well, uh, it was mentioned by a couple of, uh, of presenters and speakers um, that uh, um, we have an unprecedented unity within Europe, within Europe and uh, to include uh, uh, Turkey as well uh, uh, within NATO. And, um, and um, yes, this is true. That's, uh, that's the, uh, the screenshot of the moment, uh, but it's not clear uh, if uh, if this will be uh, uh, will 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 continue like that because we have mm -hmm. all these forces, and I'm well I'm sitting here in Budapest I'm sitting in a country uh, which uh, uh, which is is known 
for uh, for its uh, dissenting votes uh, inside uh, uh, the European Council and uh, and uh, and uh, the European Union. So uh, yes, uh, the attack on Ukraine, Russia's attack on Ukraine, has uh, has has unified uh, Europe, has unified the EU, has unified NATO. But uh, very much will depend on uh, on on what will happen. And uh, so uh, the question is very valid. Uh, the, uh, the international liberal order is particularly challenged by the inside. And that's even more dangerous for the liberal order. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, you have also two minutes. Yes, thank you very much. I, I will be very, very short. Uh, yes, uh, Ukraine is in a conflict with Russia, and unfortunately, I'm afraid it will be prolonged for a certain period. It's difficult to, to say now when it will be practically arrived at the negotiations which will, which will be accepted by the two sides. But what I want to say is that to understand that when we speak about the conflicts in, uh, in, in Ukraine, it's not only uh, reduced to the eastern flank uh, of, uh, of Europe, but at the same time, we have to take into account that one third of the agriculture in Ukraine is used this year. Mm -hmm. And together with uh, Russia, they are practically the most important exporters of cereals and sunflower. This is creating a lot of problems of the countries from Africa, from uh, the Central Asia and the uh, Arab countries as well. That's why we have to look, of course, at the idea of what is happening in Ukraine. But at the same time, we have to take into account the fact that what is happening in Ukraine, it is practically reflecting about all other countries which have a relationship with, uh, with uh, Ukraine. That's why I think that the second issue I want to underline is the problem of the Western Balkans and Turkey. From my point of view, when we want to speak about security, it has to be introduced together with the Western Balkan countries and Turkey. This is practically a regional, a Balkanic region of this, uh, this country. And Turkey is the, the port rappel. He, is, uh, he has the flag. But the rest of, of us, we are very well understanding the fact of the importance of these Western Balkans and Turkey. Mm -hmm. That's my... Okay. Uh, Thank you, Yara. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Mr. Noda? Yes, Murat, thank you very much for your question. Uh, well, I think from our experience, which we were, we were first victims of Russian military invasion, yes. that's true. I think that one thing is obvious that West, uh, collective West has failed to attract Russia to be its partner. I mean, there are a number mm -hmm. of the reasons. They are blame of the, on both sides. But Russia didn't accept uh, itself as a part of the West. There were these chances in the 90s during Mr. Yeltsin's period, definitely. But uh, since Put Mr. Putin came, after first his term, first term, we have to be, give him a credit. There was some chance. Today, we understand that Russia didn't accept the role of the junior partner as they mm -hmm. see it. I mean, I listen to lots of the Russian press uh, and they, they, they didn't want that. And plus, they didn't want to be degraded, as they say, to a status of the regional power. Plus, uh, when we discuss in Russia regional power, mm -hmm. what region do we mean? Because they are situated in Europe, they are situated in Asia, and they're also situated in North Atlantic. Russia is not only one region, Russia is in three regions. So which region power do we mean? So I think that that means that we should not keep deluding ourselves. Let's not be in illusions that Russia can be handled with uh, as a part of some, with candies, okay? That, that will not happen. However, we can... I don't think that no Russia, neither West can afford a full-fledged new confrontation like a new Cold War, especially Russia. I mean, I think uh, Professor Kreft made a very good observation about uh, inside the threats of the international order. Will we maintain this kind of unity? Because if it's not, Russia will benefit from that. So I think that our experience is that we need to find a way to contain Russia, but also to continue to speak with it. I know it sounds like mm -hmm. a very German position, which is actually it's a very good position, very clever position. But again, your role for my country 
the only hope if something happens with Russia, who can help us is not the United States, because the United States now is a rival and enemy by Russian eyes of the, but it's Turkey. I mean, the only country we can ask for me to mediate our situation with Russia is you guys. I mean, China can be the second power, but China does not interest in this region so much that mm -hmm. it could spend any political capital. So I think we should understand that there is a new reality. That would be my answer to you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Murat, if you allow me, uh, I can receive a couple of questions, if they have, of course, or if you don't allow me, I can, you know, uh, find actually, it. the time and frame is very really tight because uh -huh. we had to start uh -huh. the other panel okay. at 12 o'clock. Okay. So I would recommend to give a 10 minute break. Uh, we are old enough, you know, and then start it at 12 5. That means 5 past 12. Uh, but you can draft the questions to the chat module and maybe uh, the guest speakers may answer them by writing as text. Professor? Uh, so, sorry, uh, I lost my internet connection. Yeah. Sorry. I mean, so I think you are saying that we do not have time. Yeah. yeah so yeah. we have to give a break. So therefore, yeah. I will not uh, receive the question from the audience. So I would like to thank again for uh, their participation, uh, all panelists, their available uh, inputs. Uh, this is a very fruitful uh, and provocative uh, panel. So I would like to thank you. I would like to give the floor to Dr. Murat Aslan. Okay, thank you so much, Professor. So we will have a 10 minutes break. That means 5 past 12 is the starting time for the second panel under the moderation of Benedict. German thank you very Orient much, Institute. Murat. Thank you for, for, your, for your kind uh, coordination of the panel. Murat, thank you very much. Two Murats, thank you, thank you. Thank you both. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'll take it my side. If, if the link is broken, please try to access one more time because technical guys will try to do something. Thank you. Bye-bye.